Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to Good Orderly Direction, Practical Tools of the Bible. Today, we're discussing Genesis 34 and 35, primarily focused on Jacob becoming Israel. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. So in chapter 34, we learned of Jacob and Leah's daughter, Dinah, being raped and her brother seeking revenge on the Shechemites, taking it upon themselves to slaughter every male that was in the town of Shechem and plunder the town. Some scholars believe that Jacob and Leah were too permissive as parents and failed to protect or educate Dinah about the dangers of... Um, socializing in the community. They were letting her go out by herself. She wasn't accompanied by her brothers. She was only about 12 or 13 at this point in time. And she was going out to be seen and to see what was going on, which is not that surprising for a 12 or 13 year old. This would be eighth, ninth grade now. We need to remember that when children are developing, the prefrontal cortex, the higher order learning, the impulse control areas of our brain don't fully develop until the age of 24. So she may have been a little bit impulsive, true, uh, but she also was not wise to the ways of the world. And that's not her fault. That was a failing of her parents at that point in time. Some scholars, when you look at the um, commentaries, uh, want to focus a lot on victim blaming, but I think it's important that we take a different approach and explore, you know, how did Lee, um, I'm sorry, how did Dinah get into this position at, and, and again, she was only 12 or 13 and we can't uh, put too much responsibility on a 12 or 13 year old. So anyhow, uh, I only bring this chapter up because it is an important segue into what happens next. Um, however, obviously, I'm just hitting the highlights because I know it's a disturbing chapter for a lot of people. Anyhow, so this happens to, to Dinah and she comes home. Jacob finds out about it. Jacob waits until his sons have come back from the fields and tells them what has happened. And they're enraged. They take their revenge out on the town of Shechem, slaughtering all the males and plundering everything that was left, including the women and children. They didn't consult God first. They didn't act prudently. They just acted out of rage and wrath. Due to this rash and vengeful behavior, Jacob and his whole family had to move. Again, they didn't consult God before choosing, how do we respond to this? And it ended up leaving them in a position where they had, if you will, alienated or become the enemies of the entire town. So it wasn't safe for them to remain. Jacob said to his whole household, uh, and ought to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Jacob realizes, okay, bad stuff just happened and things are amiss in, in my household. One of the things he was encouraging them to do was to get rid of all the spoils from plundering Shechem and to start anew because they had made some grave errors. Then Jacob says, then come, once you purify yourself, let's go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Jacob is still trusting in God, despite the fact that his daughter had been become a victim. Uh, Jacob is still trusting in God and trusting in God's wisdom. Jacob was told by God that he needed to move and go up to Bethel. That is, J could be interpreted as Jacob using wisdom, good orderly direction to know that it wasn't safe to be there anymore. He needed to get the heck out. Or he could have heard the voice of God, depending on where you are in your um, 
belief systems. In families where there's a face of religion, a lot of families um, portray that everything is perfect and they're living this very happy, godly, Christian life. But many times there is much amiss. Underneath, behind closed doors, you see a lot of revenge, wrath, pride, gut, gluttony, and idolatry. I encourage you, take a personal inventory. What things besides God do you worship? Or to say another way, what things besides God do you treasure or work for besides God? Are you motivated by power, status, money, other humans' approval? Or are you really motivated from a place of love and, to, uh, and a desire to do God's work? What things are amiss in your household? That is, what things or behaviors are not characterized by love? Are you exhibiting patience, enjoyment of the moment, being grateful for what you have, respect for yourself, others, and God, forgiveness of yourself and others, earnestness, you know, really working and giving it your all, compassion, truthfulness, and selflessness, and courage. These are all aspects of love. And I encourage you to think about, okay, if I'm not doing these, how is it keeping me from heading in the right direction? How is it keeping me from following good orderly direction if I'm not doing these things? And in what ways can doing these things, even better than I am now, help me move further or faster um, down the path of good orderly direction toward a rich and meaningful life. God appeared to Jacob again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So this identifies a major turning point, a pivot point in the Genesis, in the book of Genesis. And God said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and model, multiply. A community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Remember, Abraham, um, the descendants were still following the family line. And, and uh, Isaac was Jacob's father. So God is keeping his promise to make nations out of the descendants of these men. Unfortunately, soon after Jacob hears this voice or Israel hears this voice from God and believes that, hey, if I keep doing the right thing, if I keep following good orderly direction, I will be fruitful and multiply and achieve great things. Soon after this, Rachel, the love of his life, dies giving birth to Benjamin, his ultimately his last son. And that is another pivotal thing because this is huge for Jacob. Some scholars suppose her un, uh, Rachel's untimely death may have been punishment for stealing the idol from her father, Laban's house, when they were leaving um, back in chapter 32, 33. Sorry, I lose track of the chapters a little bit. Um, now, whether you believe that or not, or whether you think this may have just been something that was put in Jacob's path, you know, interpret as you will. Not, at, not long after Rachel died, Isaac, Jacob's father, died. And Esau and Jacob had to bury him. It's interesting to note that just before suffering extreme tragedy, some of which we have yet to see, you know, that's coming in the not so distant chapters, Jacob was promised to be the father of nations. So God came to him and said, you will be fruitful. You will multiply. You will um, have kings among your descendants. And so Jacob's feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden, tragedy strikes. And he's like, what the heck? Uh, 
Was this God's way of providing hope to Jacob, knowing that tragedy was coming? So he said, you know, he didn't tell him ahead of time bad things were fixing to happen, but he said, trust me, good things will come. Uh, I don't know. What can we learn about radical acceptance from this experience? Remember, radical acceptance means taking the good with the bad. Radical acceptance of Rachel's death, for example, might be accepting the fact that, hey, I got to love her. I got to have her in my life. She bore me all these children. It was cut, cut short. You know, I wish she was still with me but how much richer is my life because she was in it. So embracing the good with the bad. Um, resilience is also recognizing what you have as well as, in, and things that are going well, as well as things that are going crappy. And potentially at this point, it really puts things into perspective for Israel, Jacob, because everything is not perfect. And throughout his life, everything has not been perfect. You know, he's had some things. He had Rachel when he was fleeing from uh, Esau and hiding out from his family. And then he came back and he made amends. And all of a sudden his daughter and the love of, or, I'm sorry, his father and the love of his life dies. And his daughter became a, a victim. So Jacob certainly does, I'm sorry. Israel certainly doesn't have a perfect life. However, he also recognizes and he perseveres in the face of adversity. And I'm wondering what we can learn from this. Principles that were highlighted in this chapter or these two chapters are prudence or lack thereof. They did not consult good orderly direction. They did not consult God about, okay, this has happened. It's real. What's the best way to respond? Uh, they reacted impulsively, vengefully, and ultimately it caused them a lot of heartache because they had to upend their entire family and move. It shows a respect for God and religion. Uh, it's important to note that when God came to uh, Jacob, or when Jacob heard God's voice, however you want to say it, he recognized that there was a need to purify his household and to get right with God, start over again, and be respectful of religion. Forgiveness. God recognizes that, you know, some, the humans have made some mistakes. But he goes to Jacob and he says, okay, you need to get right with everybody. You need to get right with me and purify your household. And then we can kind of start over again. So God does not just say, okay, all's forgiven. Never mind. You know, let's just keep going on and giving you good things. He does point out that it's important to purify yourselves and get refocused. However, he's not going to hold a grudge. And it also shows endurance in the face of tragedy. You know, we can only imagine what Jacob or Israel is going through at this point when it seems like all of a sudden he's being promised the world and also cursed with tragedy at the same time.